last week, when I was about um, to leave home to do a rehearsal of this TEDx talk, my children asked, Teddy, what are you up to today? Well, I said, I'm going to do my TEDx talk. Oh, cool, Dad. What is it about? They asked. I tried to be a little bit mysterious, saying it's about the most important thing in the world. My daughter looks at me and she says, Oh, Dad, that's so kind. Are you going to talk about me? I had to disappoint her. Oh, darling, sorry, it's not about you, and it's also not about mommy or your little brother. It's about that other most important, most fundamental thing in the world. Her brother joins in rather confidently and says, well, it's, it's, if it's not about me or mummy, um, then it must be about Star Wars or tennis, because what else is more important in the world? I had to disappoint him too. I said, no, it's about taxation. So there they are, uh, blocking the door, yelling, no, Daddy, no, you will be so boring. These TED Talks, they're so cool, and you will spoil the fun for everyone. So can you please promise us something? When you drive up to the venue, think about something else to talk about. You have 15 minutes. Oh, and by the way, my son adds, please don't forget forget to pay our membership fees for tennis because we don't want to be late again. So there I am in the car thinking, children, <sighs> you will be so boring, Daddy, but please don't forget to pay our membership fees for tennis. I drive onto the street when something starts to dawn. Paying membership fees, membership fees. Isn't that what I'm going to talk about today? I park the car and I go onto the internet to dig up a quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt. And I make it the first slide of this presentation. Here it is. Taxes are the dues that we pay for the privileges of membership in an organized society. It tells us three things. One, we're all members of this club called society. Two, to be able to enjoy the benefits, we have to pay a membership fee. And that membership fee is called taxation. It's basically just like any other membership fee for your tennis club, for your Netflix account. You pay the fee, you become a member, and you enjoy the benefits. Now, Something strange is going on. Everyone likes to receive the benefits and the privileges of this club called society. But no one likes to pay the membership fee, the tax. So tax evasion, tax avoidance, poor compliance, Panama Papers, we're actually in a pretty bad place as far as taxes are concerned. So you may be wondering, so we have here this tax guy on stage telling us that we're paying tax as a membership fee for the benefits of an organized society. But hey, I cannot remember when I have ever signed up to this agreement or this contract or agreed to its terms and conditions. You're damn right. No one has ever signed anything. And the reason for that is that the agreement the contract I'm talking about is a social contract. The social contract. The contract which we're all a party to, but which actually doesn't exist. Let me tell you a bit more. We as humans have come a long way from what's happening in the animal kingdom. Today it's no longer eat or be eaten, no. In all society, we take care of each other. Why? Because we have the social contract. We've also moved on from the time in which one ruler, either by agreement or by force, was telling us, the people, what to do, demanding us to pay tax for him or his agenda. 
that's no longer what we do under our social contract. No. Today, we've all become part of this democratic society, a club in which the members agree under the social contract that some of them, the government, will take care of the public goods and public services, but on behalf and in the name of the people. Of course, those in government need resources, and taxation serves the objective of providing the necessary financial means. As such, the social contract is the foundation of our society and the basis of our legal and tax system. Now, isn't that strange? That the basis of our society is something that doesn't actually exist, which is a fiction. No, not at all. It was Professor Harari who taught us that everything that brings us together as humans in society is a fiction, a social construct or an imagined reality. Whether it's all belief in a nation, in a religion or in a legal system. However, what is strange is that unlike all those other fictions which we nurture and we pass on, we fail to do exactly the same for the most fundamental fiction of them all, of the social contract. From Harari, we've also learned that any imagined reality can only continue to exert force in the world as long as the communal belief persists. And if the communal belief disappears, the power of the fiction disappears too. And that's exactly what's happening. Our belief in the social contract as the basis of society is fading. And with that, the foundation of our society in itself is fading too. In order not to let that happen, it's time to restore and to renew our belief in the social contract immediately and pass it on, not tomorrow, but today. But before doing that and start thinking about how to do it, let's pause for a few more minutes. We have to understand that the task we face in reversing the fading force of the social contract is huge. First, we are not facing one, but numerous fictions, constitutional fictions, legal fictions, regulatory fictions, tax fictions, because when you start from a fiction, everything that comes from it will be a fiction too. Two, we must know that the fictions produced by a tax system always come at the very end. They will only come in after every other fiction, every other set of rule already applies or have been set. As such, as Polito called it, tax fictions are fictions upon stills, fictions upon other fictions. It's time for a quick example. Let's start with a bank. Correction. Let's start with an entity which we've all come to accept as a bank. I say that because banks don't exist. An entity is only a bank when the regulation considers it to be a bank. It is when the conditions in the law are met. So there you are, your first fiction, the bank. Now, my bank needs financing. So they call in a number of experts to tell them how to do it via debt or via equity. First, it is the company lawyer coming in and he explains by his own set of rules, his own fictions, what financing will be equity, shares giving rise to dividends, 
or debt loans giving rise to interest payments. Secondly, the regulator, who looks after the bank's minimum required capital, steps forward. And armed with, with his own set of fictions, his own set of rules, tells the bankers that what they've just heard from the company lawyer isn't actually correct, and that the bank needs to apply a regulatory perspective. Not the fiction of the company lawyer, but the regulatory fiction. Thirdly, there comes the rating agency. And he does to the regulator what the regulator has, do has just done to the company lawyer, telling them that he is not correct, but that a regulatory fiction should be replaced by the rating agency's fiction. So the directors of the bank are a little bit puzzled. The same set of facts, three different meanings, three different classifications, three different sets of fictions. So here comes the taxman, who's even more interested in debt or equity, because from a tax perspective, it matters quite a lot. Interest payments are deductible in the hands of a bank, whereas dividends are taxable in the hands of that same bank. And you know what he does? He comes up with another set of fictions. Now, when everyone has left, there's the economist arriving, saying, well, dear bankers, it doesn't matter at all. These are just fictions. Because any instrument in the world can be construed as either debt or equity. In the end, it's just contracts, contractual features, agreed between the parties. And all the rest is fiction upon fiction. The people on the stilts in the previous picture might be looking happy, but fiction upon fiction, fictions upon stilts, do not make people happy. Certainly not in the world of tax. With each fiction, our tax system has become more and more complex. So complex that even the most knowledgeable can hardly understand how it functions. Experience shows that people, when confronted with too many fictions or too much complexity, generally choose two paths. On the one hand, you have the people that just give up, that choose the path of relinquishing. These people know that they are entitled to some sort of tax relief, but they decide to no longer claim it or go after it. It has just become too difficult to get it. For example, in the world of dividend withholding tax, billions of billions of withholding tax relief remain unclaimed because of administrative burdens and inefficient processes. Large and small investors have just given up. On the other hand, you have the rogue people. People that use the system either by going after the benefits, benefits they are not entitled to, or by deciding themselves that the rules are not applicable to them, that tax is optional. The first approach of those giving up is, of course, far less harmful than the second one. But in the light of the foundation of our tax system, of our legal system, both approaches are equally bad. Instead of helping the fiction of the social contract to exert power in the world and force, these behaviors are diminishing it. Let me tell you about a call I had a number of years ago. A few bankers wanted to invest in Belgian shares without actually having to invest in the shares themselves. They proposed a number of derivative instruments that would grant them dividend-like income without actually receiving the dividends themselves. The absence of real dividends would, of course, lead to no dividend withholding tax, which looked rather smart to them. I was listening very carefully when they were setting out the pricing formula of these derivatives. 
factor X, factor Y, factor Z, and so on. One major element seemed missing. Tax. So I said, I'm sorry, uh, but something is not clear to me. What about tax? Should tax be not a very important element in your pricing mix? Without knowing, I raised the million dollar question. And the bankers on the other end of the line started laughing very loud. And one said, Mr. Van Oppen, um, thank you for your kind question. But it seems like you don't have much experience yet in the financial sector. Because otherwise, you would have known that no one actually pays tax in international finance. No one pays it. It's optional. Tax is for those who don't know better. The bankers couldn't stop laughing. And I, to be fair, I didn't know what to say. Why am I telling you this? Just before wrapping up my talk. Because the story perfectly explains how we've lost our belief in the social contract and the foundation of our tax system. Rule by rule, fiction by fiction, we've lost it. The story also explains why these ideas need to be restored urgently and be passed on. If I would have the same meeting today, I would hold the discussion immediately and to practice what I've been preaching. I would tell these guys the story of the social contract, the story of us being members of an organized society and the privileges that it brings. I would remind them of the membership fee, the tax we should all be paying. And I would urge them to stop laughing. I was driving home after my dry run of this talk last week and decided to call my son. I said, buddy, I've paid our membership fees as you requested this morning, but can you please make a reservation uh, for the four of us playing paddle tennis tonight? I also asked him to book a dinner table and to reserve some time because I wanted to tell them a story about the most important thing in the world. Like in the morning, he asked, Oh no, about what now, Daddy? About taxation, I answered. And I promise you, it will not be boring. 